Hello everybody, this is Tim here again to do my review for Hellraiser 5, Hellraiser Inferno. Just get out my blue right here. Hellraiser Inferno. <laughs> Hellraiser Inferno. Okay. A shady L.A. detective finds himself lost in a nightmarish world of evil when he solves a mysterious puzzle box that releases the diabolical demon Pinhead. The film is directed by Scott Derrickson, starring Craig Schaefer, uh, Nicholas Turturro, with James Remar and Doug Bradley as Pinhead, and special makeup effects by Gary J. Tunnicliffe. Okay, let's jump into this film here. This is the first in the series to go direct to DVD, uh, but the film has a decent budget from the looks of it. It looks like it's filmed really well to me. Uh, just to go ahead and say, I'll give this film a solid three stars out of a possible four. Uh, it's my third favorite in the series thus far, after the, after the first two, of course. Uh, I'd say the script, might, the little story, I would say, might be a little bit... Uh, I'd say the, uh, like the mystery of the story might be a little bit more interesting than the story of the second one. But the whole going in the, the element of going into hell and everything, that story element of the second one, makes the second one come out on top as a better Hellraiser film than this one. And also because the second one feels more like a Hellraiser film. Basically, what they did with this film was they wanted to change things up. Pinhead is no longer the world-dominating demon that he was in the first two. I mean, in, I mean, in three and four, but he's also not like he was in the first two. He's not like the pain and pleasure explorer, like worker of Leviathan or soldier of Leviathan or whatever. This is basically if you took a detective story and combined it with a uh, Hellraiser. As a matter of fact, this film has more in common story-wise with Jacob's Ladder than it does Hellraiser, I would say. But that's not a bad thing. I mean, I have nothing against a franchise wanting to change up like the its style or what it wants to do with a, with a, you know, with one of the new you know entries in the franchise. I have no problem with them adding in new things and stuff like that. But but you still have to get the film to feel like Hellraiser. I mean, it still has to feel like Hellraiser. And if you change things too much or make things too different then, you know, you, you'll mess up the style. I mean, it won't it won't feel like a Hellraiser film. It'll feel like something completely different. If you change things too much and uh, have the new style kind of not mesh completely with the, the style of Hellraiser or the style of a franchise that's already been established, then it'll seem like, you know, a what-the-fuck kind of movie. But uh, this film kind of does feel like that every now and then. There are some things in the film that don't mesh with Hellraiser at all. Like, you got, like, this scene where the detective in the film is, like, beat up by fucking, like, kung fu ninja cowboys. And that's, like, what the fuck ever. I mean, on that one, that's really fucking stupid. I don't know why that's in the film. That's such a stupid scene. Uh, the Cenobites themselves in the film, they look good. You get, like, a torso version of Chatter, which looks pretty cool. Uh, then you get, like, these two characters called the Wire Twins. They're cool. But, uh... The, what it is is I do th I believe Pinhead gets more screen time and the Cenobites in this film get more well Pinhead at least gets more screen time in this film than I've heard he get he does get more screen time in this film than he did in the first two films combined but it's just that his scenes from the first two films are more impactful than the than his scenes in this film uh, like basically when he shows up for the first time and then the detective runs into him all he does is like put his like hands at his eyes like that and like rake like like that towards the camera and then the, it just skips away. You don't see Pinhead again through like halfway through the movie. This film is more of a character study about the about the the character of Joseph Thorne, the detective, than it is about Pinhead and stuff like that, which is fine. I prefer Pinhead to be on the back burner, but once again, his character is changed again in this film. Uh, now in this film, he's like more of like a moral judge type character, which is really weird. Hearing Pinhead trying to like morally judge the detective character about the things he's doing wrong in his life, like. Why does Pinhead give a fuck? I mean, why does he even give a shit? But <laughs> whatever. So you got that. The morally judge, uh, judge, judgmental Pinhead character it comes out of nowhere, kind of. I don't get that. But uh, uh, just to jump into the story, basically what you got, not this detective played by Craig Sheffer, who is an actor that I like. Uh, he plays pretty much an asshole, a douchebag cop who, like, Cheats on his wife, fucks prostitutes, and does drugs, and takes money from crime scenes. He's such a douchebag. You, 
uh, you honestly don't give a shit what happens to him. But at the same time, I think the filmmaker, uh, I mean, I think the director, Scott Derrickson, did a good job because at the same time, you kind of feel a little sorry for him because even how, no matter how big of an asshole some guy is, seeing him go through so much torture psychologically and physically for, you know, the length of the movie still makes you feel a little bit sorry for him regardless. But he's on a, he's the, he's on a, you know, he's on a case, he's uh, checking out a crime scene, and the box is there, and there's like a child's finger and a candle, and there's a bunch of hooks there, and his partner's there with him, and fucking, uh, you know, he wants to investigate the case, try to find the child, uh, the child supposedly was still alive when his finger was cut off, but that night he leaves his wife, who you can tell like in the film, like he's neglecting his family and neglecting his daughter, despite the fact that he does care about her, he is neglecting her, and another thing about the character is in the film, you learn that you learn that he tries to make up excuses for the evil things he does, like doing drugs and cheating on his wife and stuff. Like he's he's like the type of person that will try to pretend like he's not as bad as he actually is, and like he doesn't want to come to uh, the re the reality of the fact that the things he's doing are wrong. Like he wants to just ignore them and pretend like they're not wrong until he gets a rude awakening <laughs> in the film. But um, so he's fucking a prostitute. You get, like, a really weird fucking, like, the whole scene goes to red, so you don't see any nudity while they're having sex, and I'm like, what? No no, no nudity in a Hellraiser film? That seems kind of weird. Like, that a Hellraiser film would shy away from that. That's one kind of weird chain, change, you know, in tone or in style that, I don't know, kind of makes it feel a little bit too different than me. Hellraiser's always been about sexual elements and things like that, and the sexual elements and things like that are almost... Are almost pretty much completely gone from this movie. This film is a better film than part three and four, but I will say that three and four feel well, at least three feels more like a Hellraiser film than this film. With uh, with the pain and pleasure, you know, kind of like uh, Moffitts and stuff like that. Those, I mean, those themes they kind of play in three a little bit, and here they're pretty much completely gone. This film has nothing to do with those kind of themes. I mean, it does have him in there, but just like barely. There's barely in there. But uh, this is much more of a detective story. Um, so he opens the box, like after he gets done fucking the prostitute. Um, all things go to shit. He gets, he walks out there. The wire twins are there, and you get kind of. This is like the only pain and pleasure kind of reminiscent uh, scene to those kind of themes in the entire film. Like rubbing on his chest, and then they put their hands like underneath his skin, and fucking like he's like he's you know in pain, but he likes it at the same time. That's the only scene in the entire film that kind of plays up the pain and pleasure themes. But uh, he hears he keeps hearing this child holler, and he hears this child holler, and he snaps to his senses and realizes, man, these creatures are ugly as fuck. I don't know why I'm getting horny over them, but whatever. So he gets away from them, he starts going down the stairs, and the torso version of Chatter shows up, and he fucking leaps over the side of the stairs. He manages to get away, and uh, he's fucking, um, he's trying to get away, he runs towards the door, and then he turns around all at once, the scene is like changed, I mean like the by, the room has changed, and he looks back, and it's kind of like, uh, it's like really white, kind of bluish look to it, with like uh, snow coming in, and stuff. And it's like a really cool looking, uh, like just look. This film has a really cool look to it that I just really love. Sorry, excuse me for a second. I want to get this water out of the way here. Spray bottle, I mean. But uh, yeah, this film has a really cool look to it that it just looks really good. I love like the look style of this film. I, j I just can't get enough of it. Uh, it's really fun to see, like uh, just like the different looks. Like one time, he, uh, the character of Joseph Thorne will like go through a door and he'll wind up in a completely different, you know, environment. I know stuff like that's been done before, but just like the looks of the different places he goes, like he'll go through a door and just like the look of the different, uh, completely different room and stuff will just look, you know, really cool and white looking and really interesting to look at. And I just love the look of it and everything of this film. But uh. Jump back to the film here. So Pinhead pretty much like eye rakes him, and then he wakes up the next morning, like in the room with a prostitute, and it's like nothing ever happened. He goes back to work, and then all at once he gets a fucking phone call, like from the prostitute telling him, no, I her, he can hear her getting killed over the phone, which is kind of cool. And that's kind of, you know, kind of an interesting little, you know, gruesome idea. I mean, it's been done before. It's kind of a decent little horror movie idea, though, and the way it's played in the movie with, you know, hearing her, hearing her, like, you know, dying on the other end of the phone is. It's kind of cool. So he goes back to there to the hotel. His partner comes with him, and she's fucking dead and hung up in the shower. But the film kind of shies away from the gore, which is, I don't really like that either. I prefer the gore in a Hellraiser film. 
But uh, and so he what he does is he's afraid to, he does he wants to make sure his partner won't rat on him. So what he does is plant some of his partner's stuff there. So he fucks his partner over, plants some of his partner's stuff there for collateral in case he tries to rat on him. So he won't do it. So you're like, you know, this guy's such a dick. But uh, anyway. So pretty much after that, he's uh, he's investigating the, the this case, and he hears about this uh, this fucking guy called the engineer, which I believe in the uh, Hellraiser novel, the Hellbound Heart. The engineer is actually the creature that makes the Cenobites. I could be wrong, but pretty much here, the engineer is pretty much a name that Pinhead uses. Uh, it's like a made up you know, killer that uh, that Craig Schaefer is investigating. Had set that in the squirt ball on the floor there, but uh. It's pretty much like a made-up killer that's been made up that Craig Schaefer is investigating. So he's investigating for the engineer. Uh, you can see even more how an asshole he is. He goes to like this ice cream guy who he this guy sells ice cream, but he also sells drugs, I guess. And he gives Craig Schaefer some drugs, and fucking Craig Schaefer like starts beating him up, trying to get information out of him about the engineer. And you see that even the way he treats people who are supposed to be his friends is like shit. Um, and fucking um. He tell he tells him this really creepy story about the engineer about this guy he knows named Terry, fucking like uh who took one of the engineers I guess prostitutes or something like that and he uh married her and then he came home and only her fucking head was like laying in the bed with a note that said uh you win Terry I I got what I wanted you uh, you keep the rest or something like that and that was pretty cool I like that and I like the way it was shot um. Pretty uh yeah like I said you get to learn more about you know the the, the Craig Schaefer's character and his life and how he's such an asshole and how he treats all his friends and his family like shit and neglects his family and fucking uh, treats everybody like dog shit and just won't have anything to do with his parents even he like gets a phone call and fucking it's like uh it's like somebody telling uh his wife that uh that Joseph's parents had a visit from some guy called the engineer. And fucking he goes there and you get like this really creepy fucking scene that I love where he's like going down the hallway and there's this old dude in a wheelchair with like his mouth like pulled open in a big smile like by chains and he's in a wheelchair and he's like riding by fucking Craig Schaefer and Craig Schaefer looks at him and the old man looks at him with that big demented smile and you hear like a child's like a child like laughing and it's like e -e 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 -e, like with the dude in the wheelchair's face. While the dude in the wheelchair is looking at him, he's like laughing like a child or whatever. And it's that was creepy. I like that. That was really awesome. Uh, and he goes into uh, to his room and his parents are in there. And he hears like the child screaming again. And he's fucking like getting ready to go into the room where he thinks the child might be. And then you get a really goofy comedic line where his mom is there. And she's like, uh, she's like he jerks at his gun. She's like, Joseph Thorne, you put that thing away. And I'm like, this is such an inappropriate time for comedy. It feels out of place. But he goes through the room in there, and then you get this kind of a cool scene. This is one of the only gory scenes in the film um, where he fucking turns around, and uh, the door closes behind him, and he hears his parents screaming. His, uh, his father is like, on a, is like on a hospital bed. I, uh, is on, well, his father is like being treated. I think he might have cancer or something. I'm not for sure. I don't think it ever says what exactly is wrong with him, but he's like really bad sick. And uh, he turns around, the door's slammed, and he can hear, like, his mom dying and shit, and, like, blood starts oozing underneath the door, and it's, like, really effective scene. It's kind of cool. Kind of reminds me of the scene from Hellraiser 3 when all the people got killed in the club by Pinhead. Pretty cool scene, and every time someone dies, another child's finger gets left behind at the murder scene. So that's kind of cool. I like that. Um, fucking, um... And then uh, one of the stupid things in this film is it suffers from some things that uh, these kind of like dream style like thriller type movies have where it's like a dream but then a dream thing. So like while the blood's coming in underneath the floor, he like wakes back up. He's back in his house again and gets the same phone call to go check on his parents again. And I'm like, oh, I hate that dream but then a dream repeat shit sometime. It just it's aggravating sometimes. He goes back to the hospital and it's like a fucking um, – his parents are com are gone, completely gone. And there's like just blood on the bed where his dad was, the hospital bed where his dad was. And so uh, his partner, uh, eventually his partner wants to go fucking up, uh, like go tell the police, tell the tell the captain. I mean that uh, they covered up the crime scene uh, with the dead prostitute. Like he wants to go to the captain and wants Joseph to tell him that he was there and that he knew the prostitute. But he says fuck this shit and he uh. 
jerks at the blackmail he has on his partner, and his partner, of course, is not able to turn him in. So he fucks his partner over. His partner tells him to go eat shit and tells him he he's done taking his back and he's getting the fuck out of there. And that's uh that's when he gets like a fucking videotape delivered to him where it shows like his snitch, his friend who works at a who's like sells drugs and works in the, out of a fucking ice cream vehicle. Uh, shows him getting whipped to death on the on the tape. He's like he's getting whipped to death because when Craig Schaefer was beating the fuck out of him, he said, "What am I, you whipping boy?" So of course he dies by getting the fuck whipped out of him by big chains. So he's getting the fucking shit beat out of him by chains or whipped out of him or whatever. Pretty decent death. But then you get like you get like this creature. It's supposed to be the, like the the engineer, I guess, uh, or at least one version of him. It's got like a a blank face with no eyes. Kind of looks like Chatter a little. Um, and he's got like a really long black tongue that comes out and like licks the, the finger and like burns off the fingerprint on it, uh, burns off the fingerprint on the finger. Um, and the tongue is like CGI looking. It's not bad. I mean, it's just kind of early CGI, you know, a little, little, little weak. Not bad though. Um, and then you get another scene that's kind of like a cheap scare. At one point in the movie, he's like laying on his bed and his wife's like looking down at him and he puts his hand up towards her face and it like turns into a monster hand and he jerks back and it's back to his regular hand. A little, little cheap scare like that. Not too bad, but it's kind of just a little, you know, weak scare. Um, the whole him looking for the engineer thing kind of gets a little tiresome. But it, it still holds up pretty well for the entire film. He like goes into the, him and his partner go into the, like this fucking, uh, um, this place where all these cowboys are at. It's like a, a bar, I guess. He's in there, and they're all gambling. Uh, and it's kind of weird seeing cowboys in a Hellraiser movie, but the film makes it work somehow. And then he, like, chases after the engineer. He sees there the dude that kind of looks like, the ma with the mask on, it kind of looks like Chatter. He chases after him. He kind of, like, floats away. <laughs> Craig Schaefer takes off after him, runs out in the woods, and we get the Cenobites, a shot of them again. Uh, the problem with the Cenobites in this film is uh, they... Like, the film uh, is still a good film. This is a, still a three-star film. It's a good film, and I do like this film. Uh, it's better than Hellraiser 3 and 4, uh, but Hellraiser 3 still feels more like a Hellraiser film than this one, so I can see maybe some people liking 3 better than this one. But it is a much better film than Hellraiser... But I mean, but it is a better film than Hellraiser 3 because of all those shitty fucking Cenobites in Hellraiser 3. Um... Uh, but yeah, it's like the Cenobite scenes in this one, even though like Pinhead gets more screen time than the first two films put together, I guess, or what I've heard, just the scenes of the Cenobites don't feel impactful. They just feel thrown in. They just feel thrown in there just to have them. So he sees the Cenobites out in the woods and then he fucking falls, and that's when you get like the Kung Fu Chinese cowboys who show up and beat the shit out of him and then disappear. And I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> and then he fucking like, uh... He's in this, uh, like, he's in this abandoned building, and he's looking through this telescope, and he sees his partner get killed. He's, like, uh, he's getting whipped in the back, too, and, uh, he gets a phone call, and it's, like, um, I guess it's the engineer talking to him, telling him to, to go home, and then he goes home and sees where he, uh, sees his, uh, well, no, this is funny. It's it's Pinhead obviously telling him to go home, but Pinhead wants him to go home to the place where he was born at, but instead he goes to his house, which most people normally would, and Pinhead's, like, uh, you didn't even, he's like talking to him and Pinhead's like disappointed that he didn't understand him, uh, when he told him to go home, and I'm like, who the fuck wouldn't even, would know that Pinhead? Most people would automatically go to their house, I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> Whatever, Pinhead. But, uh, anyway, so he gets there and his, his wife and daughter are like strung up on a big pillar and there's like snow all in the room and they're like going around and around in a circle, and this is a really sad moment, it kind of makes you feel sorry for the character, even though he's a douchebag. Um... Or it might just be Craig Schaefer's good acting. I don't know. His acting is pretty, pretty good and decent in this film. But um, he's there and his like his wife is like uh, they're still talking even though they're dead and they're like going around the pillar in a circle and they got like chains on. There's chains hanging up all in the room and this is this scene really reminds me of Hellraiser or uh, brings back the Hellraiser feel I would say into the film. Um. But uh, his wife's like saying, uh, why do you keep lying to me, Joseph? And his daughter's like, uh, Daddy, are you coming home? When are you coming home? And he like grabs her hand and her fucking arm falls off and breaks to pieces. And then, then they all, then both of them like evaporate into glass, like fall apart like glass. It's a really cool scene. And then fucking there's this like this therapist guy in the film played by, or psychiatrist played by James Remar. Who like uh fucking keeps talking to Joseph through the movie. He's like uh he's like the you know police psychiatrist or whatever, and um he shows up at the end of the film. You find out James Remar is actually Pinhead the entire time. He was just in disguise, 
as this character. He's like studying, you know, Joseph's character, like who he is, because dun dun dun, Joseph is in his own personal hell. Anybody with like half a brain who's watched more than one horror movie would know automatically what that that the killer in the film is going to wind up being Joseph himself because everyone that's dying are people that know Joseph and in the film over and over uh, the characters state right in, uh, right in to the audience that you know all these people and they're all dying you're the connection you know you're the connection to all these characters or all these people I mean so it's like obvious that he's the killer in some way shape or form and so he's obviously in his own hell um you get a transformation sequence when James Remar turns into Pinhead. Okay, sequence. Pinhead shows up. He says some. Says some. Uh, he gets a you know decent scene here. He tells Joseph to go home. Pretty decent scene. The Pinhead makeup and the costume and everything looks cool. Doug Bradley does fine acting wise once again. Uh, he fucking tries the shotgun Pinhead and <laughs> and then he goes through this. Uh, he goes through this door and winds up. Uh, well, Pinhead disappears. Then Craig Schaefer goes to this door and reappears in his fucking old old family's house when he was a little kid. He's there, he sees himself as a kid, which is kind of neat. Um, he goes in there, and his mom's, like, feeding him brownies or whatever, and then you get, like, this CGI scene where everything starts molding away and dying and shit, and, like, his mom turns, she's real young, and then she turns, like, real old and shit. Um, she keeps saying, she starts saying stuff like, why don't you ever visit us, Joseph? Like, talking about why don't he ever visit uh, his mom and dad at the nursing home, because he, like, neglects them, doesn't give a fuck about them. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, in the, in the movie. But, um... So, and then she transforms into like a she. Well, the morph sequence is kind of a kind of dated CGI once again, uh, but it's okay. Uh, but she morphs into like this old like fucking uh, <laughs> creepy looking version of herself with no eyeballs. Uh, pretty sure she had no eyes. And then she starts hacking at him with a fucking knife. And this is a really the fun point of the movie. The, I mean, the most fun point of the movie for me. Because Craig Schaefer with his black hair and the outfit he's got on his shotgun reminds me of Max Payne. He fucking cocks the shotgun and fucking blows her away. <laughs> Which is like, you know, Max Payne versus Pinhead almost. It's really, I just find that funny and entertaining. And his dad tries to attack him and he fucking blows him away with a shotgun. You know, decently entertaining. And then he goes to this other room and winds up in another completely different fucking area. And uh, he starts like all the people that has died in the movie that are all connected to him. All, I mean, well, everyone in the film that's died are all people that's connected to him, and they all jump out at him, and they're all fucking, like, attacking him. They're all people that he's, like, mistreated or fucked over or whatever, and the prostitute jumps out at him. Um, or people that he's used for his own evil gain or whatever, or used for, you know, as, to satisfy his evil desires or whatever, like, fucking, uh, you know, cheating on his wife or whatever. <laughs> and um, the prostitute jumps out, and he shotguns her in the shower. <laughs> And then the fucking, uh, his partner comes there and he's got like knives in his back, which is kind of funny because it's like, you know, he's been stabbed in the back. I thought that was a little bit of a, a silly kind of metaphor thing there, but whatever. He fucking like starts jerking the knives out of his back and slinging them at Craig Schaefer and fucking starts, one of them stabs him in the leg and then he shotguns him. And I'm like, damn, <laughs> this is, movie is like really entertaining for me at this point. And then he gets attacked by the ice cream guy. He fucking uh, shotguns him and he goes flying out the back of the ice cream window and fucking like flies out into... Just, just like flies away out in the the snow and he just disappears. That was kind of neat. Uh, I like that. That was entertaining. And of course he makes it to the final room and Pinhead is in there. Well, first it's like the guy with the, the well I guess it's the in, fucking well Pinhead is basically the engineer, but this other killer is like who he thinks is the engineer. And he like pulls off the mask and you know of course it is Craig Schaefer's like no big fucking surprise, so obvious. And uh, that's when Pinhead shows up and there's like chains like. In Craig Schaefer's face and everything, like, you know, this is when this movie once again starts to feel more like a Hellraiser film. The chains are like in his face, like, um, keeping him from uh, moving or whatever. <laughs> Fucking Pinhead shows up and he's got like, a, uh, you find out that Craig Schaefer's like the the fingers that they, he's been finding in the film in each murder scene is actually like the fingers of his own child self, and that his child self represents his his uh, his spirit, like his innocent spirit, and like his uh, the killer. Uh, is like, uh, the, I mean, the killer version of him is like his, his flesh, which is, you know, killing his spirit and destroying his, uh, his own innocence and his, you know, well, his spirit. <laughs> but, uh, that was entertaining, kind of a decent little idea there. But, um, once again, and Pinhead, like, comes out, though, and he's, he's giving a pretty good speech. But at the same time, he's, like, morally judging, um, Craig Schaefer's character, and he's telling Craig Schaefer, like, why he's such a douchebag and telling him, like, uh, 
telling him that this is his own hell that he's created, hence, you know, Inferno, this is like this character's own Inferno, or whatever, you know, this is like his own hell, he's been in hell the entire time since Pinhead, I raked him at the beginning of the movie, or killed him at the beginning of the movie when he fucking opened the box, when Craig Schaefer opened the box, and, um, so, he basically tells, he, Pinhead's like telling him, like, uh, all the evil stuff you've done and all that shit, you know, uh, you're your own king and this is the hell you've created, like you've made your own hell and now you've got to lie in it, you know, kind of like you've made your own bed and you got to lie in it. He's brought his own self to this place. And I know, like, the box, I believe, does supposedly attract evil people, but still just the idea, regardless of who the person is, of Pinhead, like, telling them why they're such a douchebag just seems weird. I mean, can you imagine, like, Pinhead? I mean, if Pinhead was going to tell someone why he was a douchebag, Frank was a way bigger douchebag than this guy. He should have told Frank, you know, hey, Frank, man, you're a fucking asshole, <laughs> you know. But uh, it just seems weird. But once again, Pinhead's character gets tweaked and changed a little in each film. Um... You could just say, you know, he is all these different versions of himself all rolled into one. Like, he can be, you know, a servant of Leviathan like he is in the first two. Like, he can be like an explorer of pain and pleasure like he is in the first two. And he can be like world-dominating pinhead like he is in three and four. He can also be moral judge pinhead like he is in five. You can just see him as all these different things. But me, personally, I just prefer him to be like he is in the first two. Um, World domination pinhead, I'm, I'm okay with, but he gets... World Domination Pinhead gets really shitty in Hellraiser Bloodline, I gotta admit. I don't mind him too much in 3, but in Hellraiser Bloodline, he's World Domination version of Pinhead is fucking horrible. Just the stuff they let him do. He's like kidnapping the, the main character's son or whatever. That kind of stuff just makes Pinhead out to be just too much of a generic villain to me. But this film is much better than Part 4. <laughs> it's also better than 3. But not by but not by much, I would say, better than 3. I mean, the story is better than 3. And more interesting than three, I think. Um, three is pretty much just Pinhead, Will Doug Bradley having a blast. <laughs> but uh, three still comes off as being. Uh, as, uh, but I mean, three still almost as uh, good as this one, I would say, still at the same time. It's just all those shitty versions of Cinebots. Three is trying to be more fun. This film's trying to be more serious, I think, uh, in tone and trying to be more, uh, you know, get you thinking. Then three is just pretty much trying to have, you know, have fun. So I would say, yes, this film is a better film than 3, but um, I think, well, yeah, like I'm saying, 3 still feels more like a Hellraiser film to me, but this film is still a better film than 3. Uh, it's not as good as 1 and 2, uh, but it's better than 3 and 4. But uh, yeah, all in all, uh, just to wrap up the story here, so Pinhead morally judging him, which is kind of weird, or not so much morally judging him, but telling him why he's such a douchebag, which still seems kind of weird. Um, I guess that would still be morally judging him in a way. I mean, I guess that would still be morally judging him, but either way, it still seems weird. And uh, Pinhead basically says, "Welcome to hell." And then the chains like pull apart his skin, Craig Schaefer's skin, like on his face, and then his like his body falls directly in front of camera, like falls straight towards the camera. And you could just end the film there. That's it. The film just goes to black right there, and you could just end it right there, but no, he wakes up in his room. He goes, uh, he wakes back up uh, at where he was at the beginning of the film with the whore, then he goes to work, and then uh, he the same thing is like happening over again. The prostitute's calling him on the phone. He's fucking like flips out and gets ready to shoot himself. He does shoot himself, which is funny because earlier in the film when he was talking to James Remar, who we now know was actually Pinhead, was telling him about this story of the, who the engineer was, or who he heard who the engineer was about this cop who got obsessed with him and shot himself one day at his desk, and that's exactly the same thing that happens to Craig Schaefer, so it's kind of, that's kind of neat, kind of like foreshadowing, but you don't need that scene, the ending, like, uh, you don't need, it's like the, it's like, uh, we're like, it's like the end, the film ended right there where Pinhead says, welcome to hell, and then all at once, uh, the director or somebody said, you know, uh, this film's not long enough, we need to add some more shit here, and then they added that scene, and then once again, he wakes up again after that, and it's like Craig Schaefer is like now, uh, he realizes what's going on. He's in his own hell, and he'll have to live, you know, this this endless loop of his own hell over and over for all of eternity, never ending. And uh, he he fi he re finally realizes what a dick he's been to everybody and how he's you know destroyed his own life. And uh, he screams towards the camera, and that's where the film ends. Um, that was all right. Um, that scene was, but still, he couldn't just ended it right there when he says, "Welcome to hell." There's no reason to add in extra shit after that. 
it's kind of useless. But it was the ending we finally got with him, you know, realizing what an asshole he was and screaming, and then that film ending is still decent, but we didn't really need it. So all in all, this is a good film. I would I would recommend it to Hellraiser fans. Um, <clears throat> when I um. When I say the film doesn't feel so much like a Hellraiser film, there's Hellraiser elements in it that mesh together really well with the film. I don't mind, like, uh, every now and then there's always, the, every franchise is always going to want to try something different. The film still, you still get the Hellraiser elements in there, and you can still feel Hellraiser in the film, just not as strongly as you did in the first four films. But, um, uh, but Pinhead's place is uh, like still in the back burner, which is the way I like it. I prefer like the human characters to be up front and the human story to be number one, and not the Pinhead story or the Cenobite story. But um, but the film still feels enough like a Hellraiser film, and it's and it's just it's I mean it's a different approach, is what it is. It's a it's a detect it's a like they're trying to take a detective story and mesh it with the Hellraiser mythology and combine them together. That's you know I. I appreciate that. I like detective stories, and the idea of combining them with Hellraiser is kind of neat. But you know, the film comes out, you know, tone-wise, mixed results. Sometimes it feels like, uh, feels really good meshed together with Hellraiser, and other times it doesn't. Um, but out of the, out of the rest of the films after this one, uh, and this one included, this one's the best. I remember this one's the best. Um, and Craig Schaefer does a good job acting-wise. And despite the fact that sometimes this film doesn't feel like a Hellraiser film, it still does feel like a Hellraiser film. Uh, a decent amount, just not nowhere near as much as one through four, despite the fact it's much better than three and four, or at least much better than four. Uh, me taking a shit would be better than four, but anyway, it'd be more entertaining anyway. But um, as far as it goes, for this film, yeah, it's a good film. Uh, just has some. Uh, sometimes it has trouble meshing the Hellraiser elements with the detective story elements. But uh, when it does succeed at it, it does come off kind of neat and kind of cool. And Pinhead is better in this film and better used in this film, I think, than he was in Hellraiser Bloodline, where he was just kind of a joke with, like, him kidnapping the main character's son and all that kind of shit and everything. And just Hellraiser Bloodline was such a fucking disappointment. This film is like a breath of fresh air compared to that one. Um, but, yeah, this is a good film. It is. It's a good film. It's just it's not as good as one and two, but it's miles better than part four, and it's uh, it's better than part three. Even though I like part three, this film's still better than part three. But yeah, I would definitely recommend checking this film out, despite like the uh, the moral judge version of Pinhead's character, or he's not really a moral judge. I mean, only at the end of the film does he morally judge the character slightly, and that's the only time he feels off. But like I said, if you want to just consider like all these, like they tweak Pinhead's character in each film. If you want to consider all these little tweaks, you know, just all different parts of Pinhead of who he is, then you know, then that's fine. Um, I kind of do that too. I mean, it's Doug Bradley playing him in every movie except uh, Hellraiser Revelations. I mean, except for that one. But um, other than that, um, other than that one, it's pretty much Doug Bradley playing him in all the movies. So you can kind of see all the little tweaks, different little versions of him. You know, little tweak versions of him meshing together and seeing it as just the same character. But yeah, this is still a good film, and I, I highly recommend it if you are a Hellraiser. I mean, well, I, well, not highly, but I'd say I do recommend it if you're a Hellraiser fan. Um, it's one of the better films in the franchise, and I do like it, and I do enjoy watching it. So I'll see you guys again with a review for Hellraiser 6, Hellseeker, which Hellseeker kind of seems like a stupid title, but I haven't seen the film in a long time, but I remember it not being as good as this one. So I'll see you guys again with a review for Hellraiser 6.